Welcome to the Future is Borderless podcast with David Nilsson. We feature top entrepreneurs and thought leaders from around the world, those who bring a global mindset and a unique perspective to their life and business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, David Nilsson here. I'm the host of the podcast, uh, The Future is Borderless. And I launched this as a way for me to connect with business leaders uh, across the world who have what I call a borderless mindset and, and trying to make a space for where we can uh, exchange ideas, uh, shine a spotlight on new innovations and best practices, uh, and those things that are not just business, but also personal. And ultimately, the goal here is to help us grow uh, and to lead in a world that's just ever changing. Now, this episode is brought to you by Doxa Talent, a company who's obsessed with lifting global communities by creating meaningful work and making work meaningful. Doxa helps businesses to source full-time, highly skilled workers from all over the world. And as a result, these companies can scale faster, increase margin, and improve culture. To learn more about how Doxa can help you leverage borderless talent, simply go to doxatalent.com. All right. Well, I'm really excited for today's session. I'm, I'm thrilled to introduce Kent Gregoire. He's the co-founder of Stakeholder Business, uh, and Kent has made it his mission to help entrepreneurs maximize their impact. He champions a win-win approach that creates exponential value for all people that are involved. And funny enough, his entrepreneurial journey began at 14 when he launched his first manufacturing company. And since then, he's founded or led dozens of organizations, has raised millions for business ventures, and even guides, guided them to several uh, exits. Now, with 35 years under his belt advising top executives and is one of the first certified conscious capital uh, consultants globally, Kent's expertise is unmatched. I should also note that Kent leads Symphony Advantage, another statement or another testament, I should say, to his commitment to helping businesses thrive by doing good. So with that, welcome to the podcast, Kent. It's great to be here, David. Yeah, glad to have you. I, I actually, I love just looking at your bio there. You started your first business at 14. Uh, not a common thing, I would say. So I'd love to hear just a little bit about that experience uh, how did you get into business? Uh, what was your product? Um, and then what did you take away from the experience? Yeah. Um, so I had a couple smaller uh, ventures before, but they weren't actually incorporated. And I I was on the entrepreneurial path at a young age. My parents were entrepreneurs, my dad in particular. And I decided it was my turn. I, I, was, I was ready to jump in and try it out. A, a great uncle of mine had a formula for a cleaner that he had set aside. It was successful in his uh, life, but he wasn't a traditional entrepreneur, try to build something and sell it. He used the money to um, create a nice lifestyle and then let that formula sit. I, um, with a little bit of coaching with my dad, my mom, they suggested that I approach him and see if I could get the formula. The answer was yes, but I also needed to give him something. So entered into a royalty agreement. And um, then from there, I had to buy everything and create this business. Um, it was manufacturing a cleaner that was used in jewelry stores, hardware stores, um, marine, large marine. So those would be from Naples, Florida, all the way up to Burlington, Vermont, uh, mostly on the East Coast. And and um, sold it in jars, 24 cases to 24 jars to a case, and sometimes large uh, buckets as well, especially for the marine industry or auto industry. So um, it was it was a pretty exciting venture, and uh, lots and lots of learning, lots of stories. What now? So that's interesting. When I, I asked the question, I sort of assumed you were going to tell me you started a landscaping business. I think that that was my first business, <laughs> and I assumed that was yours too. So you actually were manufacturing a cleaning, and you got distribution. Yeah. My so first, how did you do um, that at fourteen? Yeah, my first one. My um, first one at fourteen. You can't technically own the company or have a bank account, so mom and dad have to help out somewhat, but um, as well as drive. My dad took me to his commercial loan officer, name I know it very well, Marcy Harding, and of course this was a long, long time ago. I was fourteen. And he said, I want you to bring a sample. We'll put a case in the back of the car. And I want you to tell her all about your cleaner. I did. And she was my first customer. And she bought some cases on consignment. Um, right. She managed to pay me for all of them. And then uh, my parents would drive me different places. But I think the most interesting story of all of those, Hills, um, hardware store, not department store, hardware store. There was one 
probably about five miles from where I lived. And they uh, allowed me to go in and do demonstrations of the product. I brought in a very, very old, I don't know what vintage automobile it was, a chrome bumper. And it excelled at cleaning chrome. It excelled at cleaning glass. Your glass would never fog again. And it actually is because it cleaned it, didn't put a film on it. Um, countertops, Corian, you name it. It just jewelry, fine jewelry, silver. Um, so you could use it in all different ways. So I would go into um, Hills <laughs> and uh, demonstrate it on the weekends. And not long ago, I came across the pictures just laughing hysterically, partly because of how I was dressed. <laughs> <laughs> And how was that? Oh, yeah. Those pants. Yeah. Don't ever <laughs> want to show those pants. There was a lot going on. That was back in the, let me think what year that probably was like in the, uh, probably like 74. Well, let me think. I was 13. So um, 63. Yeah. It wasn't quite 74. It was probably about 72. Yeah. How fun. Well, you know what goes out of style comes back eventually. So maybe you can bring them out again. Uh, yeah. Well, let's talk about what you're doing today. So I, I thought that, I thought it'd be fun to learn a little bit about uh, some of your, your er, earliest uh, experiences, but you do a tremendous amount of work in conscious capitalism. And I just, I'd love to learn a little bit about your journey towards that and sort of what got you so invested in that, that movement. Yeah. So, um, Part of it was uh, my father being an entrepreneur. Um, I had my own company when I was pretty young, not to 14 year old, but right out of uh, university. And it became a very successful venture rather quickly. He was not involved, um, although if I had one thing to do over again, I would have asked my father to be involved. I think that probably would have been um, a good thing to have done since we had a good relationship. But along the way, um, after starting that company, he realized that I wasn't um, the person who he thought I was. And he had to um, take me for a walk one day, he flew into town. He was coming in anyway. And um, he met me at my office and said, let's go for a walk. And abruptly out of nowhere, you know, said, you know, Kent, you're, you're just, you're just not who I thought you were. You're not living the values you were raised with, um, which would be caring and kind. Um, you're not paying attention to the things that really should be mattering in your personal and your business life. That seems to be out of alignment. And I think the thing that actually really upset him more than anything else, because I was financially successful in a real significant way. Um, is that I was using my money with no purpose behind it all. And boy, he was accurate. I was. Um, anything I could buy or wanted, I seemed to do. And I didn't really care what I was doing. I was still a nice person. I just was lost in the way in which I was raised. So um, that caused me to eventually wake up. I wouldn't say I woke up right away and really understood how to adjust. I did adjust. There were lots of different points um, over the past several decades that were moments in which I said, you know, there has got to be a better way to do business. The way I'm doing business seems hard. Um, I even questioned at times was I, I knew I was ethical. I pretty strong ethical um, bearing, um, but I felt I was making an awful lot of decisions that I felt didn't really serve other people very well, but they served me and they served making money. So along the way, I continue this. I'm founding companies. I'm helping others. I'm testing out this new way, which was really the way my dad did business. I had to return to my dad pre-70s, you know, how business was done back then. And um, I eventually meet John Mackey, the co-founder of uh, Conscious Capitalism, and meet him at an event in Atlanta. And I realized right then and there, speaking with him, that there was a tribe of others, and that really helped propel me into where I am today. Yeah. And and it's uh, it's interesting. So I actually didn't know that there was such thing as a certified conscious capitalism consultant, um, but you're one of the first people to obtain that uh, credential. W what does that actually mean? And like, what's the process that you go through to be able to um, earn that designation? It's a uh, year-long program, meaning the program side. There's also a case study, a use case study with a client. Uh, so you're going through, and what it's doing is it's really checking to make sure that you understand the four tenets of conscious capitalism. There's a lot in this space to learn, but that you truly understand those four tenets. You understand the relationship. You understand when working with an organization, how they come into play. The real, uh, the real 
test comes in the case study. My case study was fairly lengthy. I hit on three of the four, which I really only had to hit on one of the uh, the tenants, um, but I hit on three of the four tenants, um, particularly two of them very, very strong. I did a lot of assessment work along the way before and after. I'd have the client sign off and attest to the changes and the transformation in their organization, whereas I spelled out. Um, and you kind of um, you do it in writing and then you defend it as almost like a thesis uh, verbally. I had two people grilling me about it, um, Nathan and Amanda. It was a really, really good experience. Um, I tell you, the most daunting thing was all these other people were traditional consultants in this program. I mean, traditional consultants. They're used to writing 3,000 page reports and I don't like writing reports. So the most daunting thing was to write this. I was in my Sprinter RV on the beach, literally next to the beach in Maine. And I'm like, I got to get this thing done. I sat down one morning and I just hammered it out and I finished it up the following day. I did a quick edit of it and I sent it in and I was sure it wasn't going to hit the muster. It did. And um, the live part, I think, was really meaningful because it helped me understand that what I was working on um, that it attested to, I was focused on the right things. I understood it and um, I passed right there. Not everybody passes their first time. It can take several times. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was good. Yeah. It sounds like it. I, um, I, I thought, you know, just as I was uh, sitting here, I was thinking to myself, you know, you started a uh, stakeholder business uh, and that, you know, people may not understand what conscious capital really is and what the difference is between that and stakeholder capitalism. And so do you mind just hitting on that sure. just briefly? Yeah, Conscious Capitalism, amazing organization and a movement. I would say there are the four tenants, purpose. And so you're looking at your stakeholders. Um, you're going through, you're looking at culture, et cetera. And so when you think about it, um, it's, it's a framework. It's in essence a framework. And it's extremely inspirational. We're Stakeholder capitalism comes in, which um, there's a lot of room. Um, let's put it this way. I wouldn't say there's a common definition of stakeholder capitalism. There's a more common definition of conscious capitalism. But stakeholder capitalism is really focusing on the stakeholders who are involved. And the comparison would be where we've been. And that's around shareholder capitalism. So in stakeholder capitalism, we're looking at ways to optimize the value for each stakeholder, not just one stakeholder group, which has traditionally been shareholders slash investors and oftentimes senior level leaders. So it's around understanding the value that's being created and make sure that it's being optimized, but not um, in a way in which it's a very collaborative and a co-elevated effort. And so we see a lot more innovation. These are the companies that... Um, you know, during COVID, um, assuming their industry, well, even if their industry was hit hard, are still here today. That's because they take a long-term approach to understand that building a sustainable business is about making the decisions um, that are not only going to be healthy for the business, but also healthy for society and our environment. Do you think, I mean, it's funny, I, re I remember, you know, call it five to 10 years ago, this sort of conversation was just getting started and I mean, I know it's existed for a long time, but it became a little bit more popular and mainstream uh, from the standpoint of um, uh, it was part of the conversation, let's say, in the entrepreneurial communities. But today, people actually really are taking it seriously. I get it from the entrepreneur's perspective. I understand why the people inside the business uh, would appreciate this approach. But how hard is it to get the external stakeholders, i.e. the shareholders uh, or boards, uh, to adopt this as well? Yeah, it um, it's gonna it always has to start at the top. Doesn't mean it has to start at the board. It might be the CEO, for example, with Interface Carpet, um, which has been around fifty years. About thirty years ago, Ray Anderson, the founder, um, you know, had an epiphany, and he was very, very certain that the purpose of their business would be a restorative company. Now they happen to be the number one example in the world still today. Um, but it takes that kind of person who understands it and is going to carry it forward. Um, it can be very, very exciting, but it takes a while for some people to come on board. I was speaking with uh, leaders uh, directly who work right with the CEO of one of the largest companies in the world this morning. Um, they're an incoming client. 
And, you know, they've got the skeptics on their team and their senior leadership team. They're the skeptics that are still there. Um, they want to see one of our story works. Um, that's why we're having conversations to show them an, a great example. It happens to be interface of the work that was done where people would say it's impossible. You know, it absolutely could never work. You can't be a restorative company. You're a carpet manufacturer, one of the dirtiest, you know, manufacturing businesses in the world. And yet they've done it. And anybody in the world who's looking at sustainability, one of the names that will come out of their mouth immediately, and they'll only have good things to say is interface carpet. Yeah. I, I feel like this is just so timely because I, I, you know, I'm in the talent business, right? So, you know, about, I don't know, a year ago, I read a report by McKinsey that talked about the new personas that have emerged post COVID. And two of the three are highly purpose driven. Um, I think it's pretty clear that both employees and consumers are looking for uh, deeper meaning and, um, you know, call it alignment with their values. So how can a company who historically has done business in the traditional sense make that shift to becoming more purpose-driven? And and I'd love to hear just in your words, what are the benefits of doing that? Yeah, well, the benefits are quite significant. There's good case studies around the benefits. You certainly have, you know, attracting employees, retaining employees. Innovation goes way up. One of the things people say when we start looking at when we see these improvements and we're talking about optimizing value amongst various stakeholders, where, you know, where's this money coming from? Early on in the shift, it doesn't mean that it costs less money to do this work. It can be a little bit of a hit to earnings. But over time, what we see when we look at, to the external environment would be our relationship to marketing, as an example, and public relations. Traditionally, in many companies, we're spending an awful lot of money to convince people to buy our products. Look at Patagonia. Take a specific example. We all know them, even if Patagonia isn't available in a market, most people know the story. Patagonia does not spend very much money on marketing and they don't need to. Why? Because their brand has a particular identity with consumers. Even those who do not buy Patagonia identify with their brand. Very, very, very loyal base of people. And so when we look at some of the benefits that take place, and there's many of them, um, customer loyalty is absolutely one of them that goes way up. Over time, profits increase. And one of the things that was um, done in a research project um, in the book, I'm trying, Firms of Endearment, the co-authors um, did a bunch of research on some uh, companies, S&P 500. And in that research, it showed that the um, rate of returns were 14 to 1 better in purpose-driven companies. I can tell you there's lots of statistics, there's lots of um, evidence that shows purpose-driven companies do much better. But like anything, it's a journey and the journey never ends. I think that's something that's really important. It's always about continuously evolving and thinking about what is the worthy problem we're truly trying to solve here above and beyond just the solution we have for our customers. So that's a really big piece. And people today want meaning. 60% um, of workers um, that are under the age of 35, I believe it is, want to be working for a company that has a direct correlation between what they're doing and the benefits to society or environment. And I want to say that even a higher percentage of workers want to make sure that their company is, in fact, solving that real meaningful problem. Um, it's it's just become the way. If workers are thinking that way, which we've discovered, consumers are as well. Because during the pandemic, people were making a much more conscious choice as to how they were spending their money, even on brands that were more expensive because they wanted to be able to identify with the brand that they were purchasing. And that's continued today. Yeah. You know, when you say 14 to one in terms of like the, I think that was the profitability of these S&P companies, how do you know, like, how do you know whether you're a purpose-driven company or not? Because I, I would argue mm -hmm. that many, if not most companies have a purpose, right? That they've written, they put it on the wall, but how do you know, like who's really purpose-driven versus not? Yeah. So uh, there's a, there are many different ways I could describe this, but one that I found more recently seems to resonate. It also raises a little bit of hair on some people's neck. And I, I try not to do that very often, but even when I found out it raised people's hair, all of a sudden they told me they get it. 
Okay. Many of us think that we have purpose in our companies. And the question would then be, is our purpose truly serving something much, much greater than our company? And is it solving a worthy problem, perhaps in a community, gang violence, homelessness? People would say, yeah, but my company has nothing to do with that. You know, there's lots of ways to use a company to actually benefit and to help see that those problems are solved. So that's kind of piece one. Where I want to compare it to and where it does, as I mentioned, raise some questions until um, a, generally a much longer conversation, but are organizations who choose to give their money and say that's the purpose of their organization. We're going to give money to this organization and that organization. There's nothing wrong with giving money. We wouldn't define that as a purpose-driven company. And interesting, it does not raise the profits. Hmm. Well, think it does, but it doesn't. Um, I had a client now, I want to say seven years ago in Atlanta. Um, he was introduced to me by his attorney. And one of the first meetings we had, he said, not only um, have I been an absent parent, but I've made so much money, I feel really embarrassed. And this is why I've been giving my money away. And we just give money away all the time. But I realize it's not making any impact. What can I do? That was the first client that I really dug in and did this work with. By the way, I also, I also ran the company for this CEO for a year afterwards. Got it. You know, it's yeah. funny that I went to a board training at IMD in Switzerland. And one of the things they talked about was this, I, the CSR, or the ESG, that it has to be good for business, but also aligned with the business, right? And the, the mm -hmm. idea is that, um, you know, if if you're in the, call it the, the product manufacturing space, which giving to homelessness, it's hard to connect those two. And I'm just curious if you, you subscribe to that same belief. No, not actually. I think that there are lots of opportunities to do that, but we don't have to actually link the product that we're selling or the service that we're selling uh, to directly in the problem that we're trying to solve. An example would be um, gun violence. You know, you can have gun violence in a community. Understanding why gun violence really exists and understanding the youth, those youth could be literally aimed in a different area and doing amazing work. Why not open up something like a beer brewery or open any kind of business at all or have an existing business? Because one can be purpose-driven and actually move their company from a non-purpose-driven non-solving worthy problem to completely purpose-driven solving worthy problems. There is no right stage to do it other than to begin doing it. So there doesn't need to be a direct correlation. Service companies um, are oftentimes an example. They'll be like, yeah, but all I'm doing is servicing corporations. Yeah. I wonder what leadership would think. What are the employees leaning into? What other problems are there? Are there even problems internally within the workforce? Are there hundreds or thousands of employees in some large companies? How could we be doing a better job? Do we have our own employees who are not prospering in life? Is that where we need to begin? So I like to say it isn't so much about um, having to nail the higher purpose from the beginning. It's beginning to explore it. It's beginning to stress test it. I have to say, of all the work I could probably talk with you about today, the area I have never seen done well internally is purpose, not the purpose I'm talking about. The reason being is because most people don't actually know what this purpose looks like, how to create it in a way in which you can stress test it. It engages all of your stakeholders. You can engage all of your stakeholders with purpose. Wow, that's a different company. It seems like a... Um... Well, I'm actually curious, maybe if you could take me one step further, because I remember, you know, full disclosure to our audience here, the first time that I, I really met Kent, we shared a stage at a conference in, I think it was Rio, Reno or Tahoe. Tahoe. And uh, yeah, Tahoe. And you, you made the comment that purpose is the most important decision that a CEO makes. And, yeah. and it really, like the things you talked about really resonated for me. So why I wanted you to come on and talk about this, but can you explain why it's the most important thing and how does a CEO go about aligning that purpose with all the different stakeholders? 
Yeah. So the first thing is the reason I think um, it's the most strategic decision a company will ever make because it is the true news, the the true uh, North Star. Um, it is the place in which every decision we make needs to move there. In our own company, our number one value is actually return to purpose. That's our number one value. We have other values that sound a little more traditional. I wouldn't say they're traditional values, but that particular one. So when we're talking about something and we begin to head in a different direction, we always check ourselves. Are we on mark with purpose? And if we're not, we need to abandon it and get back on track. Um, and we've had to do that. We're a relatively young company. We check ourselves on a regular basis. Um, the, the notion of purpose, one of the ways to really think about it is when stakeholders say it's impossible. Like, Going to the moon is impossible. Helping, however, for people to see that their role, that they have a distinct role, what they can do to help make it a real possibility. When you can do that, you now get alignment with your stakeholders. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. I don't know that I finished it out, but that larger company that I met with uh, senior level executives this morning, that's really part of what's going on. Some of the executives, and it's, a, you know, as I said, they're in many, many countries. Um, it's a big organization. Some of those executives, you know, see the, they see it as an impossible. They don't know how to do it. So our job is to show them other companies that have actually done it, not just as in, oh, this company did it, but right now our Beyond Zero film is being screened. It was invited to the Cannes Film Festival. And so, you know, it's being screened there. That is an example that has, um, been um, followed for over 30 years. It's in, and companies need to see that example. So when we look at the North Star, it is one, it's not only an extremely strategic point, but it's something that should have such great meaning that our stakeholders want to know, our suppliers want to know how we, how they can help us achieve it. But in that conversation, hopefully we've asked them first, how can we help you achieve your purpose, not can you give me better prices? Can you do this? Can you do that? Yeah. What can I do to create value for you? It's all about creating value. And in the value creation, we see more innovation. We see costs go down. We see people making this connection directly to work. Um, I'm going to pull up something because it can circle back in. I had to write these down. So I'm going to look at my um, talk. I came across it today. It's um, done by research, a great place to work, something that our company follows. And, and we know some of the folks there. Um, but there are three questions that would predict workplace turnover in their research. And they're, they're pretty good at doing this, by the way. Um, these are the three questions. Are you proud of where you work? Do you find meaning in your work? And do you have fun at work? If one of those is no, they're probably going to leave the organization. Just one question is a no. It's been quite well tested after I got it from another member of my office, um, in one of my co-founders, Megan. Um, you know, I, I did a little more research on it and I found out that others have found almost these same exact questions. The other co-founder is Nathan Havey, who's the writer and director of the film that's at the Cannes Film Festival right now, and a fascinating human. Have you seen, so I'm selfishly, I want to ask this question, uh, and then I want to get back to something you said a minute ago, but selfishly, I have, you know, between, um, with my business, about 700 employees, and we are a fully remote operation. So I'm curious if you've seen companies that do that really well, particularly the fun where it's harder to build that sense of community and like connection that you would get through water cooler talk or lunch tables and things like that. Yeah. Um, companies that traditionally do it well um, are companies in which leadership understands that it is a workable solution. When leaders begin to have the old mindset of more hierarchy, more control, it falls apart every time. There's a direct correlation. So it has to come from the top. It is a very cultural aspect. Now, it is also being aware of the needs of employees. In your case, you've got a lot of employees who work remotely. It's not going to be something that they're they're not actually going to gain particular value by working at client sites often. So it's a little bit easier. 
where if somebody's in retail, of course, we know somebody's in retail and they have a physical store, they've got to be there. Most organizations that don't do that really well are, it's because at the top, they have a notion that the only way it works is the way that it works for them. Yeah. Instead of paying attention to the broader base of stakeholders, you think about the stakeholder play also. Many organizations are missing the, the opportunity that some of these employees would benefit more by actually having an opportunity now and then to go to another stakeholder's office for a purpose, maybe do some shadowing, maybe do some mentoring, reverse mentoring, whatever it may be but actually connect to help create richer environments um, and to create more meaning at work. And by the way, that's a really good way to create um, stronger um, stakeholder relationships, which lead to more value. When I use the word innovation, you know, innovation is a big word. I really mean creating new value that can be delivered to um, stakeholders, can be delivered to customers, either for money or perhaps to an internal group um, that's going to be able to do their job even better. Those would be examples. Yeah. By the way, I, I um, innovation is something that's really interesting to me. I went to a class one time at London Business School, and we mm-hmm. talked about innovation, and they they shared all the different ways that things can be that you can innovate. One is by creating something brand new. One is by extracting, another is by combining things that you know. Like, there's lots of different ways to innovate. It's not always by creating something by scratch. Uh, Kent, I know we're getting close to the end of the time, but I want to just a couple quick questions to sort of wrap us up. The first one is you talked a minute ago about people needing to see specific examples. And I wondered if you could share um, a specific example where you've sort of implemented this win-win approach and you've seen this like dramatic impact on value for all the stakeholders involved. Yeah, well, so some we've implemented. I actually wanted to talk a little bit, one that I think some of your listeners may know, and I wanted to choose that I was kind of anticipating this question. It frequently comes up, and that's Grayston uh, Bakery. Some people know they're out of Yonkers, New York, and they think of them as brownies. I know once a year I get a gift of brownies from them. They are the most amazing brownies. So people would be thinking about, well, if they're in the brownie business, the traditional um, shareholder capitalism model would be, you know, where are we going to get our employees and how quickly can we train them? You know, let's see if we can have less of them. Maybe we don't want to pay them as much. How can we get our ingredients? you know, less cost and stuff. And they actually don't pay attention to those things. Um, They uh, look for employees that um, would have a hard time finding a job elsewhere. They have a line waiting up at their door, literally, sometimes physically, um, but also proverbial. They have a very, very long line of people who want to work there because their culture is so, so special. They spend a lot of time in investment in the training side. So when people come in the door and they're trained, they're ready for their job, and they're delivering a real high quality of of performance and productivity. So one of the things that this company has been able to do, um, they don't hire people to make brownies. They hire people, uh, They excuse me, they make brownies to hire more people. That's the kind of purpose that they have. And I I like using examples that are a little bit different um, because I think it helps people think outside the box. Another one is Elaine Fisher. Uh, Megan on our team has a strong relationship with Elaine Fisher. That is her name, but it's also, you know, a half a billion dollar brand. It's uh, women clothing. They do things really, really well in terms of stakeholder engagement. They're a pioneer in sustainable fashion in the marketplace. And some of the key things that they've been able to do um, would would it be their collaborative leadership model, but it's not just leadership. They have a very strong two-way communication with all employees so that employees truly feel valued. They've done this in ways that I have heard companies talk, they do it. No, no, no. They do this. This is the real deal. It is a real conversation. Every single person in that organization has a voice and their voice is heard. And oftentimes, some of the greatest things that come out of companies like this um, are actually coming from what I used to call the fringes. I wouldn't call it that anymore. They're coming out of other humans that traditionally weren't tapped into. Um, They've also, um, were the first um, clothing company be committed to um, like sustainable clothing. So they had an initiative to go do this. They wanted to make sure that they were 
um, much farther, a lot like Interface, which has you know gone beyond um, zero um, in their carbon emissions. That would be an understatement. They wanted to make sure they were doing the right things, even beyond sustainable packaging, pioneering regenerative uh, materials, etc. Uh, their values are very, very strong. Um, Elaine even signed, I think it's called a living wage proclamation that was to make sure that not only were they paying a living wage, but that their suppliers were all paying a living wage, that they were paying the amount they needed to for the goods to make sure that their suppliers had the money that was needed. Um, a lot of times I'll get a lot of pushback on these types of ideas and people say, this just isn't how we've done business. This makes no sense to me. This sounds like more cost. Yeah, we're only looking at one side when that happens. The benefits are really extraordinary. It is a longer term play. But when we talk about creating, and I don't use the word sustainable in an environmental aspect, when we talk about a sustainable business model, environment and society, and how we treat our employees and all our stakeholders are going to be front and center. So there's a lot of things I could say about Eileen Fisher's company, but they've done a really good job. They are a B corporation um, and they, they, they do the real work. By the way, there is not one company I know of today that would hit every single mark on conscious capitalism or stakeholder business or anything else. It's a journey. Everybody's working on it. Yeah, I love that. You know what? We'll leave it there. Uh, we've been talking to Kent Gregor, the uh, a co-founder of Stakeholder Business. Kent, where can people learn more about the work that you're doing? Yeah, stakeholderbusiness.com would be the best way. Also, Kent Gregoire, G-R-E-G-O-I-R-E. I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram, um, but stakeholderbusiness.com. Lots of resources out there. And one of the things that we pay particular attention to is we want to make sure that you have the right resources you need. So we put resources out there around B Labs, the World you know, Economic Forum, um, where to get assessments, which assessments to use and when. Let us know this isn't about what we have on um, proprietary. It's about helping to expand the game of business to build a world that works for everyone. It takes a lot of us to do this work. Awesome. All right. We'll get, we'll get those resources in the show notes. And thanks again for being on the podcast today. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Future is Borderless podcast with David Nilsson. Be sure to click subscribe to future episodes so you can hear from more top entrepreneurs and thought leaders. And we'll see you again next time.